are these people? So last week, Colin, we read a story about from Eva Bartlett about her time in Gaza and mentioned then that there was a part one to that that I figured we'd read this week. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read Eva's part one as our part two. So we're going to do that. But this is about her time in Gaza, right? In Palestine specifically. So this is from November 2013, right? So wanted to do this because I think it's important to talk about how this wasn't just for, after October 6th, right? 7th, whichever that day was, right? This has been happening for a minute. Um, so, and as we read this, try, you know, keep in mind this is actually not now, even though it will seem like it, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, but um, Eva writes, over the years, since May 2007, I have lived in different areas of occupied Palestine, witnessing the crimes of the Zionist entity and sharing in the daily tragedies, injustices, and realities of Palestinian lives. So, in the occupied West Bank in 07, I volunteered with the ISM for eight months, during which time I was detained at a protest against a Jewish-only highway in the West Bank, arrested at a roadblock removal action, held handcuffed and shackled for two days, and later was finally deported and banned from occupied Palestine, right? So all these blue uh, text here is links. I have Eva's description, uh, her article linked in the description below. So you're welcome to go check that out and follow all those sub links here. Um, so during those months, I was witness to the ugliest aspects of life under Zionist rule attacks by illegal Jewish colonists, also armed, and by Zionist soldiers on Palestinian children, women, and elderly, humiliating, humiliating military checkpoints, some with zoo-like turnstiles, all which served to delay or completely prevent Palestinians' movement, and raids and weeks-long lockdowns on Palestinian towns and cities in which the Zionist army ransacks homes and usually abducts one or more members of the family, including children. There are currently 195 Palestinians' children in Zionist prisons. Keep in mind, this was when, Colin? No, November of 2013. So, in Susia, a hamlet in the South Hebron Hills, I witnessed land being stolen and quickly annexed by illegal Jewish colonists. As we were documenting this annexation, a colonist gleefully admitted that the land was Palestinian but that the grapevines they'd planted on the land were worth 60,000 shekels, roughly $17,000, and were intended for wine production. It doesn't matter. See, the grapes we go will be wine, and I will drink the wine. It doesn't matter at all that you speak. So, lovely sentiment, I guess. Um, I slept in the tents of the Palestinian families, who two decades earlier had been evicted from their homes, and now reside in ramshackle tents, many times demolished by the Zionist army, and always under threat of the next demolition. We stayed with them in hopes of preventing the inevitable attacks by the nearby colonist, Haji Khalil, an elder in the 80s, in his 80s, had been brutally beaten by colonists the year before I met him. He was, again, along with his wife, brutally beaten the year after meeting him. In encounters with the army, which has a military base near Susia, I would often hear them call the occupied West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, testament to their ignorance and brainwashing. Then again, the Zionist Occupation Army website doesn't even pretend to recognize Palestine either, historic or current likewise referring to Judea and Samaria. I, it reminds me of that thing Netanyahu got caught of this week, right? Where he had his yeah. his map that didn't include that kind of stuff. Right. Um, Khalil, Hebron itself is one of the most phenomenally brazen examples of illegal Jewish colonists' control of Palestinian land. Roughly 800 armed colonists have the run H2 an area of Khalil under full Zionist control. Particularly in Tel Ramedia, the attacks have been frequent and severe over the years. Their statistic aggression supported by Zionist soldiers. The Palestinians of all ages are frequently targeted and families have been brutally evicted from their homes by the colonists who then occupy the homes. 
Many times over in occupied Palestine, I found myself and other solidarity activists doing themes which seemed to be an utter waste of time. In Khalil, we would stand for hours near the military checkpoints and monitor whether Palestinians were unduly being held back or prevented passage by the Zionist soldiers. In some cases, our president shamed the soldiers and Palestinians were allowed passage, but in most cases, the soldiers were so belligerent they didn't care whether we saw and filmed their acts of cruelty against Palestinians. Often, we too were detained or arrested by Zionist soldiers when refusing to leave an area suddenly deemed a closed military zone, a tactic the Zionist armies used to keep both Palestinians and internationals out of an area, and also to annex more Palestinian land, as was the case of Susia. On Shuhada, Martyr Street, once the thriving and prosperous main street of Khalil, now a ghost street, palms shuttered and racist hate graffiti sprayed on doors and walls, we would sit for hours under the sun, merely as a presence which might dissuade the colonists from attacking Palestinian children as they walked to school, or Palestinian women and elders as they moved about. Sitting for hours seemed like a colossal waste of time, but in many cases, being present did actually enable a degree of safe passage. We participated in rebuilding homes demolished by the Zionist military under feeble pretexts of lack of building permits, Israeli granted, or zoning laws. On one such occasion, the family we were with was rebuilding for a third time. The Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions estimates that at least 27,000 Palestinian homes have been demolished since 1967, not including those bombed in Gaza. Again, all these numbers are going to be way low since it's right. way more now. Under the Prowler plan, the Zionists intended to displace 70,000 Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, destroying 35 villages in the Nakab Desert, occupied Palestine. In all of season, we joined families in areas known for brutal attacks by the illegal colonists, harvesting olives with the Palestinian locals until the inevitable attacks occurred. On one occasion, a Palestinian received a nasty head wound from the hefty rocks slung at him. I narrowly missed receiving a rock to the temple, my camera hand blocking it. The six or so colonists on a hill above us were not chagrined when we yelled that they were going to kill someone was, after all, their intent. Another absurdity during all of harvest season, and in general to any farmer trying to access his or her land, is the need to obtain a permit one granted or not by the Zionists, and even with this permit, there's no guarantee that the Palestinians will be able to access and work on their land. During a military invasion in the old city of Nablus, in the north of the West Bank, we walked the streets to bring food to Palestinians trapped in their homes and escorted those who had been outside of their homes when the curfew was imposed. At one point during the evening lockdown, after escorting three women to houses surrounded by Zionist soldiers, a Palestinian medic we were with was taken captive by the soldiers, blindfolded and handcuffed, and used as a human shield to deter Palestinian resistance from fighting back against the invading soldiers. None of our attempts to negotiate his release were successful, informing the soldiers that taking civilians, medics yet, captive as human shields was illegal, had no, had absolutely no impact. After all, Zionists are above the law. Belin, a village north of Ramallah, was one of the first villages to protest the gargantuan illegal wall the Zionists were building, which snakes deeply into the already occupied West Bank. Since 2005, men, women, children, elders from Belin, have marched every Friday on their land, protesting the latest Zionist annexation and the loss of 60% of village land. They are systematically met with an assault of live ammunition, rubber-coated, metal bullets, and volleys of tear gas. The rubber bullets are, in fact, metal bearings with a very thin coating of rubber, often intentionally split open before being shot in order to inflict maximum injury. They are meant for use only on the legs, but Zionist soldiers routinely shoot at the face. The amount of tear gas fired on Belen protesters is staggering, but more lethal 
is the manner in which they are fired. Often they are shot, shot directly at the person, which in the case of Bassam Abu Rahim resulted in his death. Shot from a mere few meters away with high velocity tear gas canister, Bassam didn't survive as of his killing in April 2009, he was the 18th protesting against the wall to be murdered by the Zionist army. Many 14 to 16 year olds and a 10 year old among the dead. Those seen as organizers are systematically abducted both during the demonstrations and also during night raids on the village and are usually kept without charge for months on end some of the 134 Palestinians being held in Zionist prisons under administrative detention. Participating in Berlin and the numerous other Palestinian villages holding such Gandhian protests, we marched with them and were likewise debilitated by the clouds of tear gas. When it seemed the army was going to abduct a Palestinian, we would attempt to de-arrest him or her on one occasion by wrapping our limbs around Adib. One of Bilin many times abducted protesters. We managed to fend off his arrest, but took a beating to the body and kicking to the head before the soldiers lobbed a tear gas canister directly at us. The irony of such brutality on the various nonviolent protests is that corporate media often say, why aren't there any Palestinian Gandhis? But every day of surviving under Zionist rule is in itself nonviolent protest not to mention the actual demonstrations happening every week. What was what was that quote you talked about from Turay earlier? You know, for nonviolence um, to work? Your enemy must have a conscience. Which clearly they don't in this case. So... Actually, let me try and find... While you read, let me try and find the exact... Yep. Um, I well, I'm sure I say it. While I've witnessed the horrific acts of violence and degradation against Palestinians at the hand of the Zionist army and colonists, in my roughly four years in occupied Palestine, I've also surprisingly seen much beauty, generosity, culture, and resilience. This would not be surprising to anyone who knows Palestinians, but to an observer, hearing only of the various wars the Zionist state inflicts on the occupied Palestinians, one would hardly expect beauty in life to flourish. However, suffering and tragedy far outweigh joy and hope in an imbalance similar to that of the power imbalance between the heavily armed Zionist state and the armed with rocks and homemade rockets occupied Palestinians. The least I can do, we can do, is to work on shifting that power imbalance towards one of justice. So, that's that's it. That's Eva's thoughts yeah. on the matter. So, right. so I found the exact quote. Okay. Uh, so, but to give context, Kurai was talking about Dr. King regarding his nonviolent stance. Yeah. So he said, Dr. King's policy was that nonviolence would achieve the gains for Black people in the United States. Mm. His major assumption was that if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and be moved to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one facetious, fallacy, facetious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. Yeah. The United States has none. Oh. So, yeah. So it's the idea, basically, like in terms of kind of, and you can kind of see the Christian knees of it with Dr. King at the time. Yeah, turn the other cheek uh, and all that. It's like, turn the mm -hmm. other cheek, and like if someone hurts you or ridicules you and all that, and mm -hmm. like, and, and Karma is, you know, argument is that in order to appeal to their humanity, in order for them to stop, you know, yeah, they have to have a heart. And the United States has none. And I think, is very apparent now, you know, I think for us in the space, it's very apparent, but I think given, you know, what's happening to Israel, they also, you know, have no heart. So it's like, but it's almost kind of like a lose-lose for Palestinians. For them not to fight back is damaging to them and the lives are being lost. And to resist 
makes the Israeli like government even more angry that to respond that they'll go over the top in order to exterminate them. So it's like, yeah, you know, like Palestinians are losing out given their position. Um, but it's is very but going along with what Ava was saying. It's kind of interesting with how, in a lot of ways, just even her presence, yeah, like help to kind of deter some of the violence, if not even just a little bit. So right. I think it kind of goes to show, I think the power of the international community has in terms of how to, not to necessarily stop the violence, but at least to keep it at bay for, a, for like a moment. Yeah. So I mean, even she know, said but, that that was futile on top of that, which is like, you know, I'm sure frustrating. So sure, like, and I think maybe frustrating in the sense, given what she was saying, that I feel like she probably wish I could should I want to do more. Yeah, but like, but I think even just the idea of her being there and given well now the people that we've spoken to and like now we know how Israel that, you know treats aid like, workers. You know, since plenty of them have perished by doing the same thing. Right, you mm -hmm. know Rachel Corey, and you know the aid workers from uh, Jose Andres's organization, who I've got problems with, but you know the people still should not have been deliberately targeted. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I think that, and, and she mirrors talks from other people who have been in the region, saying the same things. So. You know, I, I I read those and I, I I just get the sense of like like that that could have been written yesterday. It's fair. Right. Like you know what I mean? Like uh, you know, we hear journalists talk about that now who are in the region. So uh, you know, I think my despair is just the fact that there's change not happening. So right. And until that is the case i will still be ranting and still be raving about it because these are humans being slaughtered at this point so uh, you know i will do the least i can do for my little holdout here and you know what feels like occupied florida but <laughs> you know not nearly <laughs> as bad so you know uh yeah i mean it's just uh, frustrating to say the least and i know me and you feel that way after every story every week you know like we're we're tired of talking about it you know and i think if we're tired well, like well, let's preface by saying it's not that we don't want to talk about it but it's yeah. just the fatigue of talking about story after story after story after story after story regarding Gaza and like nothing yeah. is happening nothing yeah. is working and I think what makes me really infuriated is like the push by the left crowd is like silent in terms of oh and, and they're trying to do they really haven't said it but they're kind of implying it in terms of Mullen. Oh, we will vote for Kamala because when when Kamala has made it very clear, less, she's, she, uh, yep. she's less genocidal than Trump will be. Like imagine, you know? imagine sitting there talking to a Palestinian and trying to convince them to vote for someone who said that nothing will fundamentally change. Like that's a good thing to their face. Imagine doing that and right. sleeping at night. What? Uh, anyway, right. well, they can because it doesn't really affect them, or yeah. they just deny it. It's so they don't have to think about it. But it's basically the lie that they tell themselves. Yes. That, oh, yeah. We know that they suck, and yeah, we listen to what they say. And it's really at this point, but Trump, but say, Trump will like, be worse on it. How? In what way? Well, it's going to be a worse well, yeah. genocide. What? How can a genocide be worse? And what, like, well, it's already is worse. Right, and, right. And it's like, the Democrats have given Biden a head start. Yeah. 
So it's yep. like, and there's no guarantee that Gaza is going to exist in two months. Oh, like we could very well exterminate Palestinians by November. So, yeah. and given that, if that's the case, Trump doesn't have to do anything. The Democrats would have done his dirty work for him. So it's, but it's just the idea of this. And I really haven't heard people say this because I think people have learned since 2020 about the idea of pushing Biden left and they did it. And like, <laughs> yeah, but happened. So this is I every four years really this happens. That talking point now, but like, it's kind of implied that that's what they plan to do, plan to do. Well, and uh, in how many times Kamala left on the issue when, again, given the first story I talked about, J Street, she's already been unequivocal in saying. Israel yeah. has a right to defend itself, meaning I am not changing the policies that basically my donors told me to do. Um, so fuck off. Well, Essentially is what she said. Uh, you know, how many times we have to tell people that electoralism in any way, shape or form will not be the answer here. And it's one of the other reasons why I wanted to bring this. Look at the tangible things Eva was a part of. Right? Like being there, helping them uh, pull in goods for themselves, helping the, you know, like tangible actions are what will fix things. And mm -hmm. until people start focusing on those actions that they can take and ignoring everything else, we're in for a bad time because that is how they distract you from doing the things we need to do. And Talking about that kind of stuff is the reason we're demonetized on YouTube. So go to codashv.com slash Indie News Network or scan that QR code on your screen and help keep us in biz over here. Um, you know, if you're in the live chat, you can put exclamation mark donate if you so want to. Um, it'll Nightbot will send you a little link. And if you can't give monetarily, just liking and subscribing, hitting that share button, trying to get us to as many people as possible. And letting us know what you think. Leave a comment. We do read them. You know, we appreciate your feedback. So please don't be shy and get in those comment sections. You know, otherwise, thanks for watching.